In first, we meet the woman who shattered one of the highest glass ceilings in the land. President Ronald Reagan made history when he announced her nomination on July 7, 1981. I will send to the Senate the nomination of Judge Sandra Day O'Connor of Arizona Court of Appeals for confirmation as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. It was a stunning advancement for our nation, and one of the first things we learn in FIRST is that Sandra Day O'Connor was uniquely qualified to carry it forward. She knew what it was like to be an outsider. That informed her, her judgment. As a child growing up on a remote, sprawling ranch in the Arizona desert, she developed an inner toughness that helped her push through challenges that could have stopped her. From leaving home at a young age to attend school, to facing the reality of discrimination later on. When she's coming out of law school, high in her class, not a single law firm in the state of California will even give her an interview as a lawyer. One gave her an interview to be a legal secretary and asked her how her typing was. Thomas, a former reporter and editor at Time and Newsweek and the author of 10 books, was given unprecedented access to O'Connor's personal papers and former law clerks. The result is a complex and fascinating portrait of the person beneath the robe. I spent hours and hours and hours with the clerks and with my wife and with seven justices of the U.S. Supreme Court and various federal judges trying to figure her out because it's not always quite so clear. I, I think we got there but uh, it's, uh, I've never worked so hard in my life. As readers and Americans, we're fortunate he did. About six months before the release of FIRST, O'Connor announced that she would retire from public life due to advancing dementia, leaving behind a legacy of civility that's been hard to replace. Working on this book made me conscious of something that we have lost in our public life, and I'd like to get it back. Find out why that matters in this edition of First Person, one-on-one -on -one with Evan Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Brenda. This is your 10th book, but the title is First. And as I read it, I kept coming back to what a great title that really is, because that is really the essence of what you're exploring here is the burden and the blessing of being first. Both. I mean, she came into a man's man, the law especially, as it was a man's world. I mean, these incredible stories of when she's coming out of law school, high in her class. They didn't keep class rank at Stanford, but maybe number three. Not a single law firm in the state of California will even give her an interview as a lawyer. One gave her an interview to be a legal secretary and asked her how her typing was. That's, you know, she, it was just a dark age compared to today. Not that we don't have ways to go today, but compared to today, it was just the dark ages. So she was not only the first Supreme Court justice, female spirit, but first majority leader of a state senate in Arizona, of, of, any, of any state, but she was in Arizona. And even first in her family to, to leave the ranch and to go do so many things on her own at such a young age. Uh, she was really always by herself in a way, even though she had a great family support. She was a trailblazer. She had to be brave. Right. She, she had, had to be brave, brave. at a very yeah. young age. And you know, she, although she was enormously confident and comes across that way, she was scared. You know, it was interesting to me, public speaking, for instance. She, she, she's given more speeches than any Supreme Court justice in history. She's been to all 50 states. She's been all over the world preaching the rule of law. But when she was young, she was afraid of public speaking. Her, her law school pal, Beatsy Laws, was really worried about her performance at the moot court, you know, these trial, these competitions in law school, because she was scared of talking. And she herself said that when she was a, a lawyer, you know, her knees would knock and her, her throat would close. She had to overcome a lot of fear, but she did. What drew you to this project? How did it all start for you? Justice O'Connor had been thinking about doing her memoir. Uh, she wrote a memoir about her life on the ranch called The Lazy Bee, but this to do a full memoir. But she never got around to it. I have a feeling she didn't. Re she wanted to be remembered, but I, she didn't. I'm, I don't think she really wanted to spill all the beans. Uh, so it got stalled. So anyway, she got Alzheimer's herself. She got dementia in the process. In the of process, this. while she was thinking about this, and so the family decided, and she decided, let's just go with a biography. I was the Random House author with a law degree. Oh, uh, okay. And so they came to me. They checked me out with some other historians. 
and so they came to me. Oh, they came to you. Okay, I wondered if it was something that had just been a, a project for you too. Well, I jumped at it. I said right. yes. It's not an authorized book. They have no control over it, uh, but but I did have complete access. Most of, the Supreme Court is a secret place. You can't do a really good one unless you have unless you're inside. And I had a letter from her to all of her law clerks, to the other justices, to her friends, asking them to talk to me. And I was given exclusive access to her papers. One thing that's very clear, too, in her early life and then in her years in law school is she always knew her own mind. I mean, she certainly had uh, many options and directions she could have gone in, but she wasn't overly influenced by other people. And, and that was true, too, in her choice of partner in John O'Connor. Although I just finished saying that she was scared at times. She had a deep inner gyroscope, confidence, whatever you call yeah, it. Yeah, kind of a confidence. Even a sense of destiny. She once wrote a note about her own sense of destiny. She had this, some people are just born with it. Not just born with it. Her father, although he's a harsh guy and rude in some ways, loved her and supported her and adored her. And she bathed in that. And her mother loved her and supported her. And she felt their love. And I think that was enormously affirming to her. You've talked a little bit too in these last few days in different interviews about what she gained from her mother. And there were some really important things that she, that she learned about just human behavior and interaction and, and succeeding on your own terms. This was, to me, really important. The father, wonderful though he was, after a couple of drinks, could be a bully at night. And, and Sandra's there and watching this. And the father was a provocateur. Sandra watched as her mother, who's a lovely person on this dusty ranch, her mother always wore a dress, uh, hose, <laughs> nice shoes, wanting to be a lady, not wanting to be, not wanting to learn to milk the cow, you know, always a lady. But importantly, the mother, when the father starts going after the mom, she does not take the bait. She's not putting him down. She's not fleeing and crying. She's just rolling with it. That was an incredibly important lesson. Very secure. Very secure, but just learning how to deal with difficult males. When Sandra is the majority leader of the state Senate in the Arizona Senate in 1970, the males are terrible to her. Some of them are drunk. You know, they're teasing her. They're giving her a hard time. She walks away from the stupid fights. Let the other person overreact. Now, it was hard on her. One of her aides told me they found her, she found her once crying in the bathroom. You know, she's not invulnerable, but she would either just tough it out or just roll with it. What drove her to continue on through that? There were many who would say, I don't need this. She, she never didn't. backed down. I think at some point she realizes she's a role model for women. I mean, she always had that sense? Yeah, I mean, she's not a feminist in our modern sense. She didn't even use the word feminist. But that sense that I know I can withstand it so... I have an obligation to continue she on. She wanted to be a bridge from the kind of traditional woman to something else. You describe her as the most powerful woman in America of her time, really. Well, I, you know, as compared to, uh, yes. I mean, she had a lot, of, leaving aside comparisons, she was the Supreme Court Justice who preserved abortion rights and affirmative action for 25 years. I don't care what gender you are, that's a pretty big legacy. One of the things you pointed out is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been getting a lot of attention, yeah. deservedly yeah. so, of course, for her accomplishments too, yeah. um, but that she's often, we often forget that she is the dissenting. Yeah. And Ruth. Sandra Day O'Connor was a... 330 yeah. times in 25 years, Sandra Day O'Connor cast the decisive vote. That's a lot of power. And as you say, Justice Ginsburg really did her most influential work as a lawyer. If you see the movie, it's the pre, uh, I mean, she's been a good justice, but she's been in the, in the minority a lot. Justice O'Connor liked to be in the majority, and she, she understood political power. I have to say, political is a dangerous word to use with the Supreme Court. I mean, a sort of small p political, but she knew how to get five votes. Looking back on even the beginning of her law career, was being a judge something that was always an aspiration of hers, or was it something that she came to more out of the way things went, but yet found a real true uh, affinity for it and, and a very a very deep... Yeah, you know, that's a really good question that I don't actually know the answer to. It, she decides to become a judge when she's in the state legislature, and part of it is just wanting to get out of the state legislature. Did she have some deep yearning from way back to be a judge? I don't think so. I, I, I have asked this question. 
I, I really couldn't ask it meaningfully of her because she had dementia by the time I really started talking to her about this. I have asked this question of her sons. Their version is that she wanted to be a good lawyer, but the judge part came later. But who knows? You know, she may have was a little, who knows what she, I mean, who knows what we imagine when we're children? We have dreams. You go back a lot to her love of that course she took uh, in Western civilization yeah. and, and how it colored and influenced her intellect as a judge and her decision making as a yeah. judge. It was very important to her to be fair. I think what you're driving at is she was very non-ideological. Right. She was very pragmatic and very balanced. And she didn't really like elaborate jurisprudential theories. Uh, she jokingly said to me, She oh, didn't those, have an agenda beyond. No, she did not. I mean, she really wanted to play it straight. Now, this is a difficult subject because even judges who say they are playing it straight are influenced by their, there's a whole school of legal realism which suggests that all judges are influenced by the hamburger they ate for lunch. I mean, there's no such thing as a truly neutral judge. So, and I, I think there's some truth to that. But she made a super effort to be neutral, to call them as she saw them, on a, on a, on a, you know, listen to the facts, be practical, look at the practical consequences, as opposed to having a certain ideology that drove all her decisions. When you get to that moment where, or that, that part in the, in the biography where you talk about she's on the list, they're coming down to interview her, it, the, the, the wheels are starting to roll, and it, uh, it's funny because as a reader, I found myself thinking too, well, like, do you even want this? Like, what, a, you know, if, you have, if you're a mother with kids, you think, are you even, do you even want to take this on? And it struck me as no one would ever have said that about a male judge. It would be, of course, who turns that down? Yeah, well, her husband understood that because yeah. there was a moment when she said, and he said, Naturally. Oh, and he said, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, it was interesting to me the first time in history that that had to be a question of, do you want this? Because there's yeah. not a male judge out there who yeah, would no, question she had a that. Pretty good life, and uh, was a you know mom with three sons, and and was a big power in, in the state. And why 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 do this in, in in terms of lifestyle for sure, and also knowing that it would stress her marriage, right, and that it would dramatically change everything. They're She's, right. Well, she said this changes everything, and of course it did. And yet, even though it's not necessarily all in her words, and what you, as you're sort of taking us through the play-by-play -play of that, you do get this sense of, but she realized, this is my, I'm in the position to do this, and I have to, because it's bigger than me. She sort of couldn't believe it. I mean, one thing that was interesting was we, I have her husband's diary, and so when the Justice Department lawyers came down to interview her, it was clear to him that she had the job. And he said, he's in a diary, you got the job. And she agrees, but a couple of days later, after she's actually met with the president, President Reagan, she sort of can't believe it. It's just like, I, I, this can't be real. You talk a lot about, too, of the adjustment to the culture of the Supreme Court and that it is this very different animal than any other branch of government. I'll say. I mean, I've covered Congress and I've covered presidents. I, I was a Washington bureau chief at Newsweek for 10 years, so I, I've, I've been there. But this is a whole different world. It's, 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 justices can talk to nobody. They don't even talk to each other. They, they, they talk by memo at each other, uh, and it's very cerebral. Now, that's not to say it isn't political, but it's, 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 it's very cerebral, and if you just read the memos they exchange, they're highly technical, and it's, it's an incredible level of intellectual rigor. Uh, now, some of their decisions, the, the experts would say, are perhaps less than rigorous, but compared to Congress or the White House, it's, it's, a, diff it's a different branch of government. And the level of responsibility and weight that they feel, I'm sure. They do. I mean, one thing I learned is that she didn't, she was good on this. The Supreme Court, we think of the Supreme Court as the last word. It's actually not. It's, it's her view of it was that it's part of this conversation with the other branches of government. She had no hesitation to send a case back for more facts or to take a second look. She, she understood, maybe from that Western Civ course, but she really understood the three branches of government and how they need to talk to each other and they, they need to be checks on each other. And it's a mistake if any one of them gets too powerful. You have mentioned too that she was very pragmatic about this has to be able to live in the real world. This has to apply to how our country is today and, and what, what's needed and, yeah. and that she approached things from that viewpoint of. I mean, people get grumpy about the Supreme Court. You know, they're not supposed to look at the polls. 
I don't think she looked at the polls, but she, she could tell you, for instance, that a third of the country is completely against abortion under any circumstances, a third of the country is for abortion under any circumstances, and a third is somewhere in between. I'm sure she didn't have to read a Gallup poll to know that. Did that influence her? Yes. Coming from that background of, I hate to use the word outlier, but of not being where we see so many justices come from now, from this, from this pipeline of, of, of certain schools and backgrounds, et cetera. I mean, she was, again, I'm not fond of the word outlier, but in that way, how much did that inform her viewpoint and how she A lot. I mean, and, 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 and two, two ways. One, being a woman also is an outsider. I mean, for instance, in freedom of religion. In the early, in the 60s, the Supreme Court basically said to religion, get out of the public place. In the 70s and 80s, the Republic, conservatives are trying to bring it back a little bit, prayer in schools, or a moment of silence. And they expected her to come on board for that. She didn't because she, her test was, does it make you feel like an outsider? If there's a cross in front of the courthouse or a crush scene, the issue for her is, does it make a, the average person feel like an outsider? She knew what it was like to be an outsider. That informed her, her judgment. In the beginning, you can see her struggling to get a hold of this way things work there and and uh, the culture. Um, at what point did she start to sort of hit her stride and really somewhat revel in just the enjoying of what she was doing or the or or? Well, it was hard at first. I mean, she goes to her first conference. They have this nice tradition in the court of the justices all shaking hands. Justice Byron White, Wizard White, who had been an All Pro halfback crushes her hand. She goes into her first conference with tears, as she put it, squirting out of her eyes. And she knows that she's behind the intellectual eight ball with these guys because she just doesn't know as much. But she was a fast study. And within a couple of weeks, Justice Powell is writing his family. She's brilliant. So I think fairly quickly she got it. She, her, she told her husband after a year she felt, I'm okay. She's very tough, but she has empathy. Yeah. Uh, where does that come from? I mean, lots of different places. But uh, yeah, she had deep empathy, and it affected her jurisprudence, although she's conservative. When cases involve children, you can feel it. She moves to the left and starts doing things that she might not otherwise do because she's worried about the impact of, oh, there's a famous case where a, a soccer mom got pulled over by the cops, and she didn't have a license, and they, they marched her off to jail. And the conservatives said, well, that may be harsh, but you know, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you can't go to jail for a misdemeanor. She said, no, 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 that's wrong. For one thing, she understood how that were, the cops could use that for racial profiling. Uh, and so she had a sensitivity that other justices did not have. She came in as a pioneer with so many other uh, young women law students at that time too, and they faced so many barriers, and yet the dam sort of opened up in the 20 years after that. Uh, how much, of course, of a role did did she have to play in that even before getting to the Supreme Court? Because she wasn't someone then that said, all right, you're not going to hire me, I'm going to go home. No, she, she was not. She found a way around it. Yeah, she doesn't fit in that easily with modern campus Me Too feminism. That's not her deal. Uh, she wanted to be effective, and it, she wouldn't have been effective if she had been that way. That's not to say she wasn't fierce and tough and brave and effective. I mean, one example is she, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, she introduces it into the Arizona Senate and then lets it die in committee. The feminists are furious at her for betraying them. Why did she do that? Because she knew that it did not have the votes to pass on the floor. So why get into a st virtuous, righteous fight that she's going to lose? Instead, as majority leader, she methodically changes every law that discriminates against women in the state of Arizona, dozens of laws. So she has a huge, instead of fighting a heroic fight that might make you feel good and you can go on cable TV and boast about it, she quietly behind the scenes gets a job done. But this is classic O'Connor. And of course, the, the activists were mad at her. Oh, you're selling out and you're just doing this to get a federal judgeship. But they're still, I interviewed them, they're still mad at her. But, you know, in terms of actual impact and results. Right. And through the course of reading this, too, you realize that you needed everybody in that party in the area that they were in, right? You needed the activists, but you needed yeah. someone like her, too, who. Well, this is very uh, unfashionable today, but she believed in moderation, compromise bridge building, all the stuff that they don't do today in legislatures. And among the justices, too. She took special care to build 
the relationships she could build with them. She as... made them go to lunch. Really basic thing. When she first got there, only half the justices went to lunch. They didn't like each other. That book had just come out called The Brethren, which was full of gossip, and they were suspicious of each other who leaked it. You know. And she said, no, no, we're going to all have lunch together. And by, it took a long time, but she got them all to come to lunch. I love the story of Clarence Thomas, who, you know, the Anita Hill hearings were really rough, and he's all beat up by that. And she's not, she doesn't love those hearings, but she says, Cl you know, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And he doesn't want to. But she says, Clarence, you have to come to lunch. And he does, and he told me that made all the difference. Because they don't have to like each other, but they do have to have lunch together. They have to work together. You use the word civility a lot. Civility. She was a big believer in civility, a kind of a quaint, archaic word today, but the essence of what she believed in. You talk a lot, too, just about the legacy and that she was aware of who she was. It, it was bigger than her. It wasn't an ego thing, but she understood her place in this pivotal decision. Yeah, she saw herself as a bridge. She had a poem, a hokey poem that she carried around about the bridge builder. If somebody builds a bridge, but then doesn't cross it, um, uh, lets other pilgrims go across. She was confirmed 99 to nothing. Would that at all have happened now? Not a chance. Not a chance. I mean, for one thing, she wouldn't have even, they would, they would have found out that she wasn't right on abortion and they would have, you know, it just, it, I, I mean, you can tell from the way I'm speaking that I think something is wrong now. I don't, you know, I need to be careful not to <laughs> impose my own views on today. But I, working on this book made me conscious of something that we have lost in our public life. And I'd like to get it back. Throughout this project and as you finished it and wrapped it up and now you're presenting it to the public, what do you want readers to walk away knowing about her or truly understanding about Sandra Day O'Connor? Her, her courage uh, to do what she did took enormous courage. It's a very human story. She was human, you know, she cried, uh, but she had great courage. And although she was this remote figure in a robe, and actually sort of a forgotten figure, because Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, and you know, I'm not, Ruth Bader Ginsburg should be honored. But there was somebody 12 years before Ginsburg who was an immensely important figure and was intensely human and a great American story that we should be proud of. You've mentioned too, right, the female justices all readily give her her due for that. Yeah, they sure do. I, I mean, uh, you know, they, they know she opened the door. Evan Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. It's Thanks been a pleasure.